Well, good afternoon. It's lunchtime this time for my Facebook Live number six, and I hope some of you can make it. It's a different time of day from normal. Now, I did another little uh, video for my trailer, which I hope you enjoyed, and the idea was just to try and raise a few topics around um, your heartbeat and awareness of your heart racing or palpitation. Some people call it a flutter of the heart, and some people I've spoken to wanted me to raise a particular topic of atrial fibrillation, so I'll come to that as we go through. So firstly, you don't feel your heartbeat most of the time, uh, and why is that? Well, the body has got a lot of internal mechanisms that are hidden behind the scenes and go on without you noticing, so you breathe, you don't think about it unless you're doing something particular, or you're anxious, or you're running. Your heart beats without you knowing unless you happen to lay your head on the pillow and hear your ear throbbing possibly, or you're on some treatment that may make your heart pound a bit more, or you might feel it beating if you go out into the hot or cold atmosphere suddenly, or after you've had a few drinks when the circulation expands and you get vasodilation of the vessels and they become more obvious. So most of the time you don't have a palpitation, you don't feel anything. But a lot of patients come to the doctor because when they do feel something, it concerns them, either because they've never had it before, or because it actually makes them feel unwell, or they're just worried that it means something serious because it's new to them. And the most common cause of a palpitation, which people describe, is a thump or an extra beat. So the heart's beating nicely, regularly, and then they suddenly have a little gap, which they don't perceive as a gap, and then they feel a big jump. And that may happen occasionally, once or twice. And that's called an ectopic beat or an extra beat. And what's happening here is the heart's beating nice and regularly. And then an extra beat comes in from a lower part of the heart or even from the top a bit earlier than normal. And the heart is not conducting at this point. It's what we call refractory. So that beat doesn't go anywhere in terms of mechanical activity. Then the heart resets and the delay in resetting widens the gap between the two heartbeats. So the pulse width or the time of that particular set of beats that you feel is wider apart and in that time the heart's been filling and emptying and when it has longer to fill it fills with more blood and it has more more force that when it ejects it and you feel that pump as an extra beat or a thump in your chest so that's an ectopic which can happen and sometimes they happen in pairs over a few minutes sometimes they can happen on and off for a long period of time and a lot of people that we do tape recordings on have them and don't even know they're happening so it depends on the circumstances as to why you feel it or what may generate it. Some people notice after they've had too much coffee or caffeine, they can feel these things. Other people notice them just when they're relaxing before they go to sleep at night and they're resting. And that's because the normal heartbeat slows down and some of these other cells fire off and get in first and then cause this delay and the delay causes the change in the force of the next beat. So that's ectopics. Um, there are causes which may be pathological or what we call iatrogenic or doctor-induced cause to that. So if somebody's on diuretics or, or water pills and they have a problem with um, their potassium being low, then obviously that can cause somebody to have a reduction in the normal chemicals around the cell and make it irritable, and that can cause extra beats or ectopics and those patients often have to have potassium supplements or change of their tablets. Now, the more worrying palpitation are those that go on and become persistent. So instead of the odd misbeat or extra beats, you're having a series of beats in a row, and you may feel a flutter or a bubbling in the chest, as some people describe it. You may feel that it's regular, or you might feel it's irregular. So each beat doesn't have a exact timing the same between and it fluctuates and I did teach in one of my videos how to count your pulse feeling the wrist just below the thumb if you press gently against the artery where it crosses the bone if you've got a good pulse there you should feel it and if you use your left hand with your watch you can count the pulse by counting the number of beats say in 15 seconds and multiply by four so if it's nice and regular and you've got a beat every second your heart rate 60 a minute if it's you know, two a second, then it's going to be 30 um, uh, in that 15 seconds, then your heart's going 120, and that's that's quick. Now, that might not be abnormal. That might be after you just run up the stairs or you've just had a, a heated phone call with somebody and your heart rate goes up. So it doesn't mean it's wrong. 
But if you feel your pulse and it's going erratic or fast when you're not doing anything in particular, or you're feeling unwell during it, then that may be a sign that your heart has got a problem with the rhythm. The question is, is it a serious problem or not? So the title of this um, particular talk or, or phase time is My Heart is All a Flutter, is trying to reflect that. And I had some images in there just for interest, um, showing uh, people doing things, going out shopping, for example, and feeling the heart racing, having to stop, or an injury to a wrist, that was my wrist actually, my fellow for another reason, you know, you could collapse after an arrhythmia. And so in some circumstances, these are important warning signs that something needs attention. And if we move on to the types of regular and irregular palpitation that you can get, the normal heartbeat comes from the top of the heart. So it's above the ventricle, and that's called a supraventricular beat or if it's fast, tachycardia. So a supraventricular tachycardia may be a normal beat, a sinus tachycardia, for the reasons I explained, doing activity or being stressed. But it could be a circuit that's a re-entry or an extra reverberation of the heartbeat that's faster than normal due to some abnormal condition. Now sometimes that can be stopped by quite simple manoeuvres, holding your breath or trying to pop your ears, pinch your nose, hold your breath as long as you can before you let go, and then relax, and that can sometimes terminate these, and that's called the Valsalva manoeuvre after the person that described it. Other tricks you can do if you've got a heartbeat that's racing and you want to know, can I stop it if it's troubling you? Sometimes taking ice cold water. If you drink ice cold water out the fridge or cold drink, it's running down the gullet, which goes right behind the heart, and so this water will cool the back of the heart and can sometimes terminate this arrhythmia. So those are some tricks you can do. I wouldn't advocate pressing on your eyeballs or rubbing your neck, which some of the books say, uh, and carotid massage or rubbing the neck, something that probably should be done by a doctor under supervision in a proper setting with an ECG recording. Uh, and there's a risk if you rub the neck and there's disease in the artery, you might cause a problem with the circulation to the brain. So I would sit um, quietly and let it relax, let yourself relax see if it goes, take some regular deep breaths, or try the valsalva manoeuvre, or if you can get hold of some cold water, have a quick drink. So that might terminate your fast, regular palpitation, but you still want to get a diagnosis, and the question then is how you catch it. And normally, if it's going long enough, you get to an A&E or a GP, they can do an ECG, but often it's gone by the time you get in touch with any medical advice. If you're unwell with it, of course, an ambulance might get to you in time to take a strip on their, their recording. But if not, many of you will be referred for a 24-hour tape or event recorder to try and catch it. And often as not, when we send people for this, the day they wear it, nothing happens and, and it's blank in terms of a diagnosis. So you're still left with a problem. The more concerning type of arrhythmias, which are irregular, and the one that uh, one of the uh, CCU coronary care nurses wanted me to raise next time I spoke, and hence part of this talk, is atrial fibrillation. Now, atrial fibrillation is a very common arrhythmia that's affecting maybe 2 to 3% of the European population. It tends to come on in older people, but not always, but people, as you get older, increase the risk of this. And this is where the normal pacemaker at the top of the heart, and if you remember my little videos, in the atrium, there's a group of cells that fire off regularly. Now, if these are interrupted or fail to fire regularly, messages come in from other parts, the veins from the lungs and other bits of muscle around the edge, and fire off at high rates, about 300 a minute, and shower this chamber with these irregular and uncoordinated electrical impulses. And they move down towards the junction box between the ventricle and the atrium. So there's the bottom is the ventricle of my lower hand and the fist at the top, the atrium. Well, where my wedding ring is, there's an atrioventricular node. The top ring, my tiger's eye, is my sinoatrial node, which should be firing, but it stopped working, so this is just shimmering away. And then all these impulses are hitting this junction box very fast, and a percentage get through, but it's not getting through in a regular manner. So then you get boom, 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 boom that sort of irregularity. And if you do an ECG, you'll see that there's no normal signal from the top of the heart and the bottom of the heart is moving at different rates. And it may be fast or slow, but it's irregular. So that's an irregular heartbeat called atrial fibrillation. And the importance of that, as I mentioned before, is that if this chamber isn't contracting normally and blood flow is slow, particularly in little crevices, which are a natural part of the anatomy or lining of this chamber, 
then you will have potential for little blood clots to form. And if these form and don't adhere and go north, they can cause a stroke. So one of the most common causes of stroke, which is treatable, is atrial fibrillation. And there's a big push generally across the health service to try and make this diagnosis early. So that was the reason I said, learn to count your pulse, or if you get an irregular heartbeat, get referred. Uh, if you hear of someone that may have had a stroke in the family, ask them whether it was due to an irregular heartbeat, because that may be something that... Uh, has not been uh, picked up and they've had a stroke uh, and they're thought to be due just to blood pressure. Have they had a 24 hour tape? Have they had a, a, a diagnosis? Because you should be on specific treatment to prevent blood clots forming. And that's anticoagulation to thin your blood completely down to two or three times the normal clotting time. And either warfarin, which we all probably heard about, you go regular blood tests, or these novel oral anticoagulants, or NOACs as they're called, which can be taken as a tablet adjusted for your age and your kidney function um, and you may take them once or twice a day depending on the type and you don't need blood tests. Obviously there's a risk if you bruise or cut yourself, take longer to settle down, but the risk of the side effects are more than outweighed by preventing a stroke because you can't unfortunately undo a stroke unless you catch it very early and you're lucky enough to have a centre that does blood thinning or thrombolysis for stroke. So preventing stroke one of the causes is preventing or catching an arrhythmia such as atrial fibrillation. Uh, many people don't know they've had atrial fibrillation and present with a stroke and that's when it's first picked up. Now, In some of the other talks I've done I've talked about the importance of knowing your blood pressure because that is one cause of causing an irregular heartbeat. If your blood pressure is high it puts a strain on the chambers, it damages them over time. So knowing your blood pressure has been treated and Knowing if you've got a regular pulse or if it's irregular, getting someone to give advice is very important. There are other sorts of irregular heartbeats that can make you unwell. Um, if they come from the ventricle, if someone's had a scar from a heart attack, they may get fast and regular or fast and irregular heartbeats. But because it's the ventricle now that's generating it, they tend to be less well tolerated if there's already a scar or damage to the muscle. So that the beats coming from the top of the heart in a normal heart that go fast and cause a supraventricular tachycardia are normally well tolerated because this heart muscle, although it's going quick, it's, it's efficient. But if someone's had a damage with one wall of the heart being it's damaged with a scar, not moving properly, and you're relying on just one part of the heart moving fully, so your percentage contraction might be instead of 60 to 70 percent, might be 40 to 50 percent. When this heart goes fast, you may collapse because of lack of blood pressure. So this is a very important finding uh, when we do scans on people's hearts. That is a particular condition that may need tablets as well as the atrial fibrillation needing tablets to control the rate or to prevent it happening. And furthermore, you may need some tests to see if you need an angiogram or a picture of the arteries to see what's going on if it wasn't previously diagnosed. So just to summarise briefly, palpitations are awareness sometimes of your normal heartbeat which you previously weren't aware of but for some reason it started to become obvious to you. It may be related to stress which many of them are. It may be related to something you're doing such as um, taking too much caffeine or any other illicit drugs of course can set them off if you're even smoking heavily with cigarettes or taking some cocaine or other things obviously be wary if they're causing the arrhythmia. If you're doing something physically active and you suddenly stop breathless, yes, you might get a few extra beats and we see that on a treadmill when people do exercise testing. Sometimes they have silent extra beats, they do some exercise, they disappear, they're on resting, they come back and they're aware of their extra heartbeat. The more worrying ones, as I said, is the ones that make you feel unwell, sweaty or lightheaded and you don't want to be missing the atrial fibrillation, which is the one of the main causes that we can treat in advance for stroke. And atrial fibrillation might just come and go briefly, but as you get older, as it becomes more recurrent, it tends to perpetuate itself to become permanent. And so you want to get it early to treat the possible cause, and you want to try and prevent it happening with medication or correcting the underlying problem. I haven't mentioned it just yet till now, but we know that alcohol is a big influence on 
both blood pressure and on cardiac arrhythmias. So excess alcohol, if you're drinking more than your 15 units a day for a woman or 21 for a man with a couple of days off a week in theory for your liver to recover, then you might have an increased risk of arrhythmias. And just by reducing or stopping your alcohol intake for a while might resolve these uh, arrhythmias. So that's something you can also do for yourself in general well-being. Exercise is, is valuable and we all know that exercise is good. So a small amount of regular exercise will keep your heart fit, keep your circulation uh, fit and it may reduce the chance of you developing complications associated with an arrhythmia if you're healthy and doing your best to to regular exercise and keep your weight down. So if we think about that um, options of measuring your own heartbeat, feeling your heartbeat, uh, going to see someone to try and get a diagnosis and most of the time you'll be reassured as I've said it's an extra beat, it's not serious, uh, it will go away with time, it may be it's related to something like the menopause coming on in women and you just have to see it through or decide if you want hormone replacement therapy. It may be something that needs a cardiologist to make the diagnosis. If the GP can't, the GP can make the diagnosis in many cases and put you on appropriate treatment if you've got fibrillation and then refer you for further tests. And when you come to us as a specialist, we'll do the echo, which we've mentioned, to look at the structure of the heart. We'll put you on some tablets, quite likely beta blockers as well as the anticoagulants if it's fibrillation. If you can't tolerate beta blockers, because of asthma or other side effects, we can think of alternatives. And if you're going along all the time in fibrillation and it's of recent onset within the year and your heart doesn't look too bad on a scan, then we might try and reset it. And if it can't be done with tablets, once your heart has been monitored for a while and you've been on anticoagulants to make sure there's no clots, we can bring you in and cardiovert with a small electric shock under anaesthetic, reset the heart so it goes to sleep the normal pacemaker wakes up, takes over, and that improves the function of the heart and it will reduce the risk of stroke. You won't entirely get rid of the risk of stroke with anticoagulants, it's all a relative reduction and you can't 100% prevent recurrence of atrial fibrillation once you've reset the heart if there's been a lengthy period with heart disease in the background that's caused it. So you may need tablets to keep it regular and at some point some patients have to accept that they have an irregular heartbeat but as long as you control the rate and they feel all right you can leave them in that state safely as long as you anticoagulate them and thin the blood. So today we've covered my heart's all a flutter and I hope that you find that useful. Another question I'd bring up another time will probably be chest pain and whether it's angina or whether it's due to small vessel disease or large vessel disease but it's a separate topic I'm just raising it because that's one of the other feedback questions I've had from a patient I've seen that I'd find useful so maybe that'll be my next topic and I wish you a happy rest of the day cheerio